Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Patrick, and I'm really excited about how AI is going to help us in our jobs in the next couple of years. So this is going to be a talk about that. And I know we're all about here about talking about culture and collaborating, but I do believe tools and collaboration will go hand in hand. So I'll, I'll kick it off with a video of a tool. So this is a tool called Cursor AI, and it's like one of the new coding editors. And you see that I provided, uh, created a markdown script where I say, well, this is how I want my front end. This is how I want my back end. I want this operating system to use. I want this API. This is my directory structure. All the things that I've used to do my job. And then I say, just create it according to the specs, this code. Right? All of a sudden, you see creating all the files, it slowly creating the back end, the front end, and you see all the things that I had to do earlier by hand just being so much faster. It even has like an open API spec, you know, more documentation and all that stuff. So you see, this is already a lot faster and I'm a bad typer, right? So you've seen that. Um, and now I'm reviewing the files one by one, whether they're okay or not okay. And I see the readme as well. And um, I'm gonna try this now because I think like, yeah, who trusts the AI, right? So, let, let's see how that's going to work. Um, so the README, I open it. It's still slow, but that's me clicking, right? <laughs> yeah, I can do it a lot faster. So you see, it created all this whole thing, how to do this. So I'm going to run this. Um, so me typing manually again, pretty slow, uh, doing all the instructions that it created, uh, creating the environment to spin up the uh, the Python application, I'm installing it to the requirements it gave me. Um, and yeah, uh, it's an error. Hang on. AI can just read the error, and I just tell it, like, why don't you create the requirements? So I'm in this feedback loop of doing something, just asking the AI to do something, I'll try it, and I'll review it, and I'll come back to this. And eventually, I kind of accept uh, all the things in there. And lo and behold, now the try is working, and I got this going, right? So I spin up the application, and I open it in a browser, voila. Okay, adjacent thing, how long did it take me? A couple of minutes? I, know, I could never have done this this fast. And you can probably say, well, this is, you know, play around, and it's this simple thing, and I have a legacy code base, it's never going to work. But, you know, for demo purposes, this is simple, but I assure you, this is also helpful and working. So, what you see in the industry is that a lot of people know uh, GitHub Copilot, which is kind of the ghost text, right? It completes. Uh, then we moved into a chat somewhere on the side. But the example I've shown you is where people are, minds are heading, is you define this task, you define the specification, it executes this according to a plan, and generates me code, and we go back in the feedback loop, right? So it's, that's kind of where we're heading. Um, you, I gave it specification, but I can also tell it what identity I want it to use to code, whether it's a back-end developer, whether it's a front-end, a React specialist, I can just pull that in, right? And they probably, uh, give better results in there. And, you know, it's about staying in that flow, and we've been promised that for years. Stay in the flow, just work on what matters, just do the specifications. By the way, these clouds, there's an experiment with uh, headsets of VR, and they give better milk, but that's the side. Um, who am I? I'm Patrick, I'm passionate about DevOps and DevSecOps. Um, I'm now focusing on engineering with AI, uh, both ways, how to deliver better Gen AI applications, but how also, and this talk is about how AI can help us to do a better job. So you can hire me and talk to me about that later. So let's discuss the elephant in the room, right? Everybody's worried about their jobs in a way. Why do we still need the humans? Um, you get these kind of predictions, right? The AI code is getting generated more and more by AI contributors. It's not gonna be humans in a certain way. Um, you see messages like this, 
we're going to lay off a lot of people because AI is going to lead to a strategic shift. Uh, this is how C-level people are thinking about this productivity as well. Um, some are more nuanced in saying, well, you might not have to learn to code, but maybe you are still the one innovating and thinking about what we need to build. So not on the how, but more on the why focusing. So it will take certain tasks, and that's how I want you to look at this. Maybe things we did before, the typing, again, all the stuff. Maybe we're doing this differently. Uh, but it will not take our jobs, right? There's always still going to be one person responsible for what gets out in there. Um, and you could say, well, typing is just accelerating our typing. But as you see, the, the feedback loop is just getting so fast. And imagine us pulling in more of the Jira tickets, all the stuff. We kind of get into a flow that's going on there. I cannot fix your culture. And as Matt somewhere in the room said, probably if you're on a broken culture, you're waiting a lot more for our handouts than doing technical work. But hey, you know, that, that's another problem we're tackling. This is an interesting um, survey from Adidas where they kind of surveyed different teams on what are the things they work on, or what, where they spend their time. And what they found is that uh, more mature teams actually are able to spend more focused time on technical engineering because they don't, uh, they organize themselves better around this. So even if it's maybe the technical fraction, but think about, I just shown coding, but it's testing, it's deploying, it's like proof of concepts. There's a lot more to do. So there is a relationship that is just not like the tiny part of the, the typing. And um, in many enterprises, people are using GitHub Copilot as the one project that goes in because you know, it's obviously easy. They already have a contract. You know, the whole industry is doing it, so why not? So everybody's trying to prove this measurement of productivity. Will we have a gain? You know, there's different ways of comparing this, whether you know, uh, team A is faster than team B. Did we actually save some time? Did it make an impact on the migration? Again, everybody's struggling to quantify this thing. Um, what's interesting, maybe we're going to see some new kind of coding metrics. The number of AI edits, the number of AI requests I sent to create it, right? Maybe that's a new coding metric. Uh, I don't know. But what I do know is that a culture of learning helps. And a lot of people are afraid in their current position uh, to, sh to use it. Um, and to demonstrate the value. Because all of a sudden, if you should, uh, say that you're more productive, well, will I still have a job? So there's been cases of people not mentioning that they have productivity increase just because they want to fly under the radar. <laughs> Maybe that's the way to finally get your backlog done. But a culture of learning that you can spend your time and improving is going to be tremendously helpful in there. And I like this slide in a way that it also resonates with me. Um, if you think about AI, well, first, it's, it's hype, right? And I'm, I'm not you know, saying it's not a hype right now. Then it's cool, and you go on to all of a sudden, like, I have superpowers. And that's how I feel about this today, right? If I get more acquainted with the tools, I can get a lot more done. I can actually kind of express myself better. I can do things that I've never imagined that I'd be able to do before. So AI will not take your job it's that easy. But right now, you have to think about somebody will, that uses AI might take your job. Because we're comparing two different ways of working here. It's not about the individual. It's not about the knowledge. But it's kind of having this capability to do and work uh, with these new tools. And we've already seen this. I showed you that more and more I'm just telling it what to do. I'm not typing the coding anymore. Um, there's examples of people using voice all the time talking to this, because why would I even be typing if I'm not typing code? But what we are seeing is when you use kind of those tools, you'll do more reviewing right? uh, and less typing. And we've done this before. We, we started doing the pull requests, the, the kind of the reviews, and we're doing more and more of this. So we can get better at this. There's a flip side to this is as the AI is producing more code, we have to spend more time in doing the review times. But as the code is getting more complex, 
that it generates, we spend, again, more time reviewing because we don't understand what the AI has generated. So there's a kind of a balancing effect. You can get around this by asking more smaller changes and not a big change. It's the same thing. Like, you know, you don't do big refactorings. You do the small things in there. And I really liked how Cursor um, kind of did some help to do reviewing. On the left side, we have like the typical diff view, red, green, kind of like highlighting the changes in the code. We have the chat view, sometimes that's useful because it's explaining us what it's doing as the change. But what I find particularly interesting is on the right, where it shows the code, but it, it kind of pseudo-injected the remarks of what he was doing. So see, he removed the I at the end of the line, right? On the diff, it would just say I, but it synthesized this, uh, what this change was. So it just shows you the cognitive load of reviewing. There's, there's a few ways that also AI can help us with the kind of reducing those pieces as well. Instead of the big change, there's the one by one review, right? That, that helps me kind of get into flow. Um, this is a little bit more out there, but there is a project called the Moldable Development, which says, well, why are we just using only text in our code editors? Why don't we adapt the editor on what the domain is or the problem we're trying to do? So they're trying to find a way of giving different views, similar to the diff views, but here on what your code is doing and giving more oversight. So again, this is still experimental, but I like how this adapts to the user model of what we're trying to do and the code and the editor kind of starts adapting to that. I like to have choices, right? So why only generate one piece of code if you can have three? It's just, you know, then I can see which one is best. Um, I like fail safe that I can roll back, right? Uh, I can try it, I can go back. And um, I can give feedback, thumbs up, thumbs down, what I like. Um, GitHub, for example, tracks whether code stays in your code base to see whether their suggestions actually are long lasting. So they get feedback on what you're keeping your code base on what was a good generation. Um, and then, yeah, wait for it. Right. So we all want fast feedback, right? By the way, you've been Rickrolled. Uh, this is the default way of AI generating a video player. Um, but we all want that, right? So that kind of fast feedback is crucial in those systems. But there's a flip side to this, is that maybe we're becoming over-reliant on the AI. Looks good, come on, accept. There's a funny story about um, GitHub Copilot being tested in an enterprise, and they noticed that in the weekend, the engineers accepted the suggestions faster. Wonder why that would be. <laughs> so, me having a bit of DevOps history, um, the way that I think about this is, in DevOps, we want to kind of this journey. We had the coding, let's say that was the abstraction, going faster, automation. Then we had CI, CD, we brought in some fail-safe testing uh, in there. Then once it was in production, we had like failure uh, detection. Uh, we made the architecture more resilient. So we had to deal with less results when it failed. Observability, about not knowing what to fail, but still being able to handle it. And then eventually we had chaos engineering because we were not used to failure anymore, so we had to train ourselves to kind of still be ready in case of emergency, right? So that same progression, I think we're gonna go and see in the coding. We're still a little bit more on the left, but I can see how it's moving slowly to the right. Funny enough, this has all been described in a former paper, which was instrumental in the DevOps days. It was called like the ironies of automation. And now there's a new one, the ironies of Gen AI automation. And it's completely predicting all the things that we're seeing about the cognitive load, the task-oriented focusing, and all that stuff. So a good read on that. I talked about training, and here's a few examples. Why don't you turn your code bases into lessons? There's always a new person coming in uh, that needs to train. 
Uh, maybe you're switching more and more between code bases, so that's, that's helpful. Um, similar, you know, instead of just asking it to write a readme for the onboarding from a developer, right? AI can help there as well. And you come down to this moment, like, do we really need to understand what it's generating? You know, take the red pill, take the blue pill, we don't care anymore. We just want to express what we want as long as it works. Anyway, we're going to be a little bit torn about that. But what I do know is over the years of DevOps, um, it was ironic that we talked a lot about automation and the automation trust levels. And I apologize ahead of time, but if you think about this, initially we had something called CF Engine. And see, eventually was based on the concept of agents with a set of rules taking action, right? People were scared of that, <laughs> right? So they got into this loop of cron-based polling, changing, you know, the chef and the puppets kind of doing that. And then people still didn't like it. They wanted to do in the moment, when I run the deploy, I want to see what happened and then I'm going to fix this. Right? So it just shows you the trust levels, and people have different trust levels, and obviously it depends on how well you're organized and how well you're automated, what do you kind of are able to get to that trust level. Speaking of autonomous, this is a, a project where they take a lot of GitHub uh, in, uh, issues, and they have a benchmark of AI trying to solve them autonomously. This is uh, being, you know, presented as a, as a paper, they created like SWE agent, an autonomous coding tool, and this is now like a synthetic benchmark where a lot of the coding tools are trying to achieve this almost automated completion. Will we get there? No, but the fact that we're improving the field, I think that's the important part. And then you get leaderboards, like you know, one's trying to say that they're better than the other. You know, it's what I use from this is I, I see how people are doing things differently. So for me, it's a learning, like how, how do they kind of exceed uh, the next thing? And this brings us to Devon. Uh, this was already a couple of months old. This was started to be a commercial company, actually taking this up to a level. We have a, an agent coding. So you see it has the code, it has a terminal, it has a chat, it has a browser, and you just ask it, just do what I want, right? Um, there's another tool called ADAR, and they don't ask anymore what do you want to commit. If they feel certain, they just commit. <laughs> because why? Um, so you know about creating pull requests, but why not have the bot, if you feel certain, auto-engage with people commenting on kind of the pull request. And why only have one agent? If you can have multiple agents collaborating, working together for your code, right? One is working on that piece of the code, one is there, they're kind of collaborating. Anyway, this is, I don't have access, but I also know this is not science fiction. It's what's out there right now. So we're gonna have really fun, right? Because the thing is, what I mentioned, it's the thing on the right. When things fail, that's where the whole kind of debate, and that's where we need to get better. Um, it even goes as far as, oh, you're doing this coding together? Oh, this looks like knowledge, which should save. It has two benefits. One, you save it for the human as a track that what they did for the next person to come in. And you save it for the AI because now all of a sudden it has a better understanding of what you're trying to do. So imagine this being now employed at your team level, your group level, your company level, saving knowledge about everything you've done as a coder. So how much time have you wasted having to reverse engineer, figuring out what have been done, but keeping this knowledge? So this brings us to this. Um, well, you know, will eventually agents just be the digital worker? I know Lattice put it out there as, well, we're just going to put them on the payroll, the agents, right? They came back to this. They had quite some slack. But, you know, it's how people are thinking about this. Um, 
will we have agent team topologies? Where will the agents be, right? Will it be our coworker? Will I sometimes delegate and say, you're gonna do that task, you're gonna do that task? Or are they going up in kind of the higher levels of the company? What you're already seeing is that there's a difference, much like engineers, are you gonna be a specialist or are you gonna be a generalist? And that will depend on kind of your value, how you have to operate. It's the same thing with your agents. Are you gonna be a more specializing agent? Then you can charge, but you might be more niche. Um, so out there. And what's interesting to me is that, you know, bringing back to the culture in a way that these new technologies, I've showed how they were trained on our culture, right? The recrawl, that's our culture. But their tools also gonna change the way we are working. Um, and I, that, that's what fascinates me, right? That kind of socio-technical kind of loop uh, in between both. Because we had a lot of talk about the code of conduct, but the agents can have toxic behavior too if one agent kind of overrules all the other agents, right? So you see there's similarities in there. It, OpenAI kind of wrote what their agents should adhere to. That's like a code of conduct just for their agents. And this has been one of the instrumental papers where what they did is um, they set the stage about a town and they give different agents different kind of personalities and they let it play out for a day, a virtual day. And they capture what one was doing with the other and how it helped and how they achieved their goals and kind of work from there. What was interesting is that communication and diversity is key. If you use the same agents, they got less results. If you use more diverse agents, you get better results. So that's, again, a similarity that we're seeing. Again, this is all speculation up until this. Um, we, we have more teams, smaller teams, bigger teams. We, we have one day sprints. We don't know, but there's bound to be something different changing the way we work with this. That single specialist, right? Again, that's like the specializing agent, the more generalizing. There's room for both, but if you can do things so faster, I doubt that we can bring features faster to customers because they might get overloaded. So there's a balancing act going on over there. The way that I see it, and uh, that resonates the article with me, is that it's, we had the generalists or T-shaped people going across multiple domains. But I think the point will be is the one that was able to go across multiple domains, but then can quickly switch the domains. They're doing something different here, now they're doing it here. So this continuous learning is gonna be more important. And then, again, that feeds into my story about eventually we need to keep learning to get better at even the code reviewing. I don't have an answer to this, and I think it's a valid question. People entering the field, why would they still do this, right? If AI is gonna do so much. And I've shown you that the more senior people are better positioned because they understand what goods look like and they can do the reviews better. But if it's the first time, well then you have to learn and you have to learn a lot. So again, if somebody has ideas on how kind of we can encourage younger people to still kind of not be afraid of going into this field, uh, do let me know. Or maybe there's a future in that everything is gonna be more ops, the thing on the right, right? If the coding has been done, we're going more supervised, we're gonna more deal with all the problems with agents. But again, this is all speculation. I don't know if it's like causation or not, but the companies that are getting more funding Series A, they're getting smaller in size. So it seems like you can do more with fewer people. Um, so yes, hype, no doubt about this. Um, we have a lot of capabilities that are still coming up that are not in the mainstream tooling and not everybody has adopted. There's a long tail of adoption and we're getting there. So we typically overestimate the effect of technology in the short run, 
and we underestimate it in the long run. So when we will get there? Uh, that's the best answer I could come up with, right? Um, so we all know the saying, who watches the watchers? I feel we're now in the age on who automates the automators, right? I think like think higher level on delegating stuff. Uh, again, let's see how you can get up to the point that you're doing this. If you like this presentation, you can follow me uh, on LinkedIn. I have a YouTube channel where I post all my talks. A uh, lot of learning. Uh, I think I'm now up to 150 talks, so lots to explore. Uh, and come say hi during the event, or if you want the slides, uh, drop me a message. Uh, thank you very much. That was my talk. <laughs>